Paul, I don't have many obsessions in life, but one of the strangest is uh, continuing to think about nothing, about why isn't there nothing? Why is there anything at all? We can say it in different ways. Uh, as you've thought about the universe, its origins, uh, uh, how close have you gotten to an absolute nothing from which you would want to start your explanations? This is the Tower of Turtles problem, that we explain the universe in terms of something else, something else, and, and down we go. Uh, and most scientists would stop at the laws of physics and that they would accept that they exist for no particular reason. They're just there, they don't inquire. Uh, I've never been happy with that. It always seems to me that we can uh, ask, why do the laws of physics exist? And why do they have the form that they do? Uh, and so uh, is, is that the starting point? We can imagine that the laws of physics are there in some abstract platonic mathematical realm, but there's no physical universe. There's no space, time, matter, energy, or anything like that. But the laws are there so that the universe uh, has the potential to come into existence in compliance with those laws. I think actually many of my colleagues would re regard uh, that would be their worldview. And that's uh, absolutely right. And if I, when I push them on that in, in private conversation, uh, they would basically say that's a brute fact. We can never go beyond that. And then I say, why is it so complicated? Why are all these laws in all these different ways? How do you how do you get this uh, this uh, quantum foam with particles in and out and calculations and frequencies and, and all that? How, how do you, they said that's just it. We can never go beyond that. Right, right. So they're accepting that package of marvels or these laws uh, as something that just exists reasonlessly. There's no explanation, unexplained, underpinning of the universe. Sometimes I call that a super turtle that holds everything <laughs> up. So on that view, the reason why there is something rather than nothing is because that the, the laws that are pre-existing, maybe not in a time sense, but in a logical sense, have the power to bring into right. existence a universe from nothing. Uh, and so people uh, get confused about what you mean by nothing. I'm not talking about empty space. Uh, I'm talking about like what Stephen Hawking says, you can ask what lies north of the North Pole. The answer is nothing. Not because there's some mysterious land of nothingness there, but because there ain't no such place as yeah. north of the North Pole. It's right. simply not defined. Right. And in a simple model of the Big Bang, not in the multiverse, but just the good old single Big Bang that we knew and, and right. loved when I was a student, uh, you continue the universe backwards to that Big Bang. And it isn't that uh, this is a sudden explosion of a lump of something in a pre-existing void. It's the uh, go back to that point, and that's where space and time come into existence from nothing. So what, what is before that is like what is north of the North Pole. Mm -hmm. So the, it's just not there. Uh, it's, it's not emptiness. Um, but the laws of physics are supposed to transcend all this. So that's deeply puzzling, of course. Uh, and the question is, why are there laws of physics at all? Where do they come from? Uh, and now there's a uh, what looks like a facile answer to why there's something rather than nothing. For example, laws of physics is that there are there's only one way to have nothing, but there are many ways to have something. Um, and many of my colleagues, I think, actually take that quite seriously. That uh, uh, of course, if there was nothing, then we wouldn't be here to worry about it. But then, as soon as you've got something, whether it's laws or universe or whatever it is. Then you can carry it forward. Yes, but then you worry about, well, why those things? Why are those the things that exist? Yeah, why those laws? If you had just those laws and that was it, you have two choices. They are either some, in some sense necessary, they're the only possibility in some logical sense, and if that were the case, then you have to ask, okay, if that were the only way, why is that only way the kind of way that can bring forth uh, universes and life. Right, so again, Stephen Hawking has a very poetic way of describing this. What is it about certain equations, that, certain laws of physics, uh, that gets fire breathed into them <laughs> so that there's a universe for them to, to create and manage? Right, and, and generate life forms where we can ask questions about if it's only one way. That's right. If there's a selection effect with multiple universes, maybe that's a different ca right. character to what happens, but it still doesn't answer where did those laws come from that generates multiple universes. Right, I think it's a very legitimate question, and I think uh, the one thing we should dispense of immediately is the notion that the laws of the universe are necessary. They have to have the form that they do. For the simple reason I'm a theoretical physicist, and part of my job is to construct impoverished imaginary worlds, for example, a two-dimensional world mm -hmm. in which you can work out the equations better than in four dimensions. Well, that's a consistent universe. It's not our world, but it's a possible world. Mm -hmm. so it's easy to come up with possible worlds that are not this world, 
possible laws that are not these laws that, that we have. So clearly, the, the universe and the laws that describe it could have been otherwise. And so we're never to be led, as was Einstein, to ask, why those laws? Why this universe? And so we're back to the problem, well, uh, the only two natural states of affairs are no universe, no laws, nothing, or everything that can exist does exist. And both of those make us feel uncomfortable, but we're not very comfortable with the intermediate position, which is that some things and some laws exist, and other things don't, and then we have to worry about what that fire-breathing actuator was. Who got to decide what exists and what doesn't exist? So if you have your laws and the universe and you're uncomfortable with the laws preceding the universe because we have to ask where those came from, what's your alternative methodology to make progress? Well, there is an alternative, and it was a path that was charted by John Archibald Wheeler, a sort of mentor of mine, great influence on my thinking, and a slightly crazy character himself. Uh, and he said that the idea of the laws of physics uh, being cast in tablets of stone from everlasting to everlasting, he had this wonderful poetic touch, uh, should be discarded. That he thought that laws and observables and states of the world and mental events should all be sort of interwoven in a, a mutually supporting explanatory scheme. So in other words, the, the laws that exist are the laws that give rise to observers that observe them. So there's a sort of logical loop. Um, now, to make that work properly, you have to have a loop back in time. And he looked for, for such effects. He found, he found them in quantum mechanics, not causal influences going back in time, uh, but the fact that uh, uh, the best way of expressing it is that the state of the, the universe today, and uh, naively, many people think that the universe today is in a particular state, and that in the past there was a big bang, and that there is a particular well-defined history connecting the Big Bang to the present state. Quantum mechanics tells us that that isn't so, that just as there's uncertainty about the future, there's uncertainty about the past. There are multiple histories going back to the Big Bang. When we make observations, we cull the total number of those histories uh, that we can include in our calculations. There are certain things we can observe. It could not have been this way. It could not have been that way. Wheeler actually came up with a direct experiment to test these ideas, and, and it's correct, it's part of standard quantum mechanics. And so uh, we have to accept the fact that the nature of reality, even as it was in the past, depends upon the observations that humans make today. I can give you an explicit example. If and it's hard to imagine that. something more radical than that. Yes, <laughs> a lot of people think it's some sort of backward causation, it's not. What it's saying is that the, the reality of the past is fuzzy, the reality of the future is fuzzy, we defuzz through making observations. But well, that puts we, consciousness and the human observer into a, a critical uh, um, uh, element in, in, in the whole universal history. It does, and of course that always makes scientists feel uncomfortable because science works on the principle of objectivity that we can describe an external world uh, that goes on quite happily without us and that somehow we should get answers that don't depend upon our observations in any fundamental way. The observations just access the information that's already out there. But we know in quantum physics that simply isn't true. Wheeler came up with a variant of the famous Young's two-slit experiment in which light illuminates a pair of slits and the image is inspected on a, a further screen. And what you see is bright and dark bands called interference fringes. And now if you turn down the, uh, the source of the light so only one photon at a time goes through, uh, then uh, you can't say, for any given photon, which slit it went through and still get the interference fringes. So it's a, it's a famous conundrum at the heart of quantum mechanics. So Wheeler put a variant on this. He said, well, if you put a little telescope uh, at the image screen, you can look back and see through which slit a given photon will have come. Or you could choose to not do that. You could have a Venetian blind that you close so that the telescope wouldn't see. You could leave a decision about whether you close the blind and have the interference fringes, which imply that the photons go through both slits right. in some sense, or open the blinds and say this slit or that slit. So, uh, of course, when the photon goes through those slits, it mm -hmm. doesn't know mm -hmm. what the experiment is going to do later. Uh, but the nature of reality, whether it went through one slit or both, is determined by that later decision. So the way in which the decision is made affects the reality of what was at a past time. 
And so what's the implication of that? Well, the implication is that we can't simply divide the universe up into past, present and future, that it's all entangled in some way, in a way that forbids us from sending information into the past, but the nature of the reality of the past depends upon the observations that we carry out today. Only on this quantum scale, on a tiny scale, uh, but nevertheless the principle of this is deeply significant because it seems to embed not just human beings, but observations, whatever they are, uh, into the reality in a fundamental way. We look at it our participatory universe. For many of my colleagues it's going much too far, but what we cannot deny is that at some level uh, the universe only makes sense through observations that we can then communicate with each other. If there were no observations and no communication, there would be no science. And so it's at the, at the heart of science.